Welcome everyone to the Beyond Pesticides 40th National Forum Series, Forging a Future with Nature. My name is Paula Dinnerstein and I am the president of the board of Beyond Pesticides. And I have been the president of the board for a little more than a year now and was a longtime board member before that. I am also a lawyer with an organization called Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, which is an environmental whistleblower group. And I'm really happy to welcome you all to today's program. This is the third in the series, the final one in this series, transformative community-based change from the ground up, managing parks and playing fields with organic practices. So today we're going to move from the more theoretical, high level understanding of the issues that are facing us today to the practical level of how do we actually implement organic management of our parks, playing fields, community spaces. And we have three excellent speakers on the panel who are all professionals and experienced in these matters who are gonna talk about these uh, practical ways of achieving organic management. And we will also have a question and answer period afterwards that you can participate in. And right now, though, I'm going to turn it over for the introduction to this particular program to Jay Feldman, the executive director of Beyond Pesticides. Thank you, Paula. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome again to the third session of the 40th National Forum, Forging a Future with Nature. I'm Jay Feldman, executive director of Beyond Pesticides. During the Beyond Pesticides National Forum series, our goal has been to provide the foundation of science and hands-on experience that drives the process of change, change in how we live in our fragile ecosystems so that all their inhabitants can be sustained by complex biological communities that support life. Today's session is focused on on-the-ground practices that have been successful in transitioning to defined organic land management from community education and advocacy for changes in policy and practice to collaboration with land managers as they transition to organic compatible practices and products and to plan development training and consultation that facilitates effective land management implementation. As many of you know, we kicked off this year's forum series with Dr. Dave Goulson, author and biologist and professor who like Rachel Carson has given us the scientific basis for advocating for urgent action. We heard from farmer, author and organic advocate, Dr. Andre Liu, who collaborates with organizations and organic farmers worldwide. The second forum session served to contextualize ongoing widespread toxic chemical exposure throughout communities and all strata of society, but with the recognition that there is disproportionate harm in communities and throughout the country to people of color. Emerging out of section, session two is the understanding from the United Nations Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights, Dr. Marcus Oriana, that we are discussing a human rights issue. The foundational premise of his work, that is, there is a basic human right for a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Lest we forget the importance of pesticide use history to our current concerns and efforts, we heard from historian Dr. Jason Morris Porter. Please see the entire forum series on Beyond Pesticides website, uh, which you can access at the link in the chat. As we understand the existential challenges of our time, and that's the crises of chronic public health diseases, biodiversity collapse, and the climate emergency, we know that the elimination of petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers will contribute substantially to the protection of human and ecosystem health, including precious pollinators and keystone species on which life depends. Elimination of petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers will significantly reduce carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, potent greenhouse gas emissions while drawing down or sequestering atmospheric carbon into soil where it can be utilized by plants and stored. So today's session focuses 
it focuses in on a bright spot at a time when solutions may seem out of reach. We know how to manage land without petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers for food production and in our communities, parks, playing fields, schoolyards, home landscapes. As we illustrate in today's session, the work of protection and a sustainable future starts in communities, and it's happening now. To be clear, we are not in this session talking about pesticide reduction, better restrictions of pesticides, or the adoption of undefined sustainable or regenerative or integrated pest management practices. We are talking about a systems change, reassessing our relationship with and respect for nature, nurturing all that nature has to offer, starting with soil organisms, working with parks, departments, schools, and land managers, communities eliminate petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers, and in so doing, create a multidimensional response to the crises of our time. The system works with nature to strengthen plant resilience and cycle nutrients like nitrogen naturally. Reducing fertility costs over time, that's ecosystem services. The system retains higher levels of moisture, which allows for decreased irrigation and better adaptability to drought. Today's session is intended to provide a framework for moving forward. Please see the Parks and Sustainable Future link in the chat to follow up this session with an organic land management program in your community. Today's three speakers lead by example, Avery Camilla Ben Gratton and Chip Osborne, a community advocate, a city parks manager, and a hands-on teacher of horticulture respectively, all inspirational in their achievements and their leadership. They show us what is possible, what they have done and what they are doing. Oh yes, you'll see today having fun is also a part of working communities. We are bringing values questions to our communities. What we need to do to invest. What do we need to do to invest in the future in our children, grandchildren, and future generations? Now is the time to bring these questions and answers to our communities. We have, we at Beyond Pesticides have had the honor and privilege of working with incredible community leaders and land managers across the country. The three speakers we have brought together today are among the very best to lead this conversation. After the speaker's presentations, we will have time for questions and answers. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function in the bottom toolbar or by clicking on the three dots at the bottom right of the screen. So let's begin with Avery Camilla. Avery founded Portland Protectors to bring together Maine citizens to end the use of, and sale of synthetic lawn pesticides and fertilizers in her coastal city. Portland Protectors says, Quote, we strive to protect our kids, pets, bees, soil and Casco Bay from these toxic chemicals as they drift around neighborhoods and leach into the public water systems. After the passage of Portland's 2018 ordinance, only allowing organic compatible practices and products on public and private land in the city, Avery was appointed to the city's Landscape Management Advisory Committee created in the ordinance. So thank you, Avery, for being with us today. Thanks for all your work. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so uh, delighted to be here and excited uh, by all the uh, people that I see um, are in this forum today. As Jay said, my name is Avery Yale Camilla and I'm the co-founder of Portland Protectors in Portland, Maine. We're a coastal city. We're also a very small city. We have fewer than 70,000 residents who live here in Portland. A friend and I formed Portland Protectors in 2015. And I think what I would like to do is share um, my screen uh, with you all, because uh, I put together a PowerPoint presentation. And let's see if I can... Um, if I can achieve this, let's see what happens here. 
All right. All right. Um, hopefully uh, we can see it. If it's not, it's not crucial. I thought it just might be a little bit more exciting than than looking at at my face uh, the whole time. Um, so Portland Protectors was founded in 2015 by a friend and I, and um, we were both moms, and that's what motivated our initial interest in uh, this activity. So one of the first things that, that we did uh, when we got started is we sought advice from other local people. And um, we got inspiration for our name, Portland Protectors, from a neighboring uh, city, South Portland, where there is a very active group called Protect South Portland. And uh, so we, we took a lot of inspiration from them because that group was already pressuring their city council to pass a comprehensive organic land care ordinance, very much what we wanted to achieve in Portland. So they, they were a huge help. Um, so once we got started, we succeeded in 2018. Uh, we achieved victory. Our um, Portland City Council passed a comprehensive organic land care ordinance. And the land care ordinance, as uh, Jay mentioned, covers both public and private property and decrees that residents and the city can only use organic land care practices. And if someone fails to do that, well, the city can give them a fine of up to $500. And the city has issued one fine since the ordinance was passed. Um, there, there was one major violation that took place. Now, getting to the passage of the ordinance in 2018 took a lot of work. So let's see, where did we go? We, um, the first thing that we had to do was find allies and to start, we reached out to other environmental and health advocacy groups working in Maine to see if any other groups were working on the issue of pesticides. This gave us some early allies and a sense of what was and wasn't being done on the issue. We began to collect supporters, including other organizations and individuals. This is crucial because we needed to show that we were a group rather than just a couple individuals. We created a Facebook page and we set up a free MailChimp account so that we could keep in touch with our supporters via email. And um, MailChimp offers a free service up to a certain, certain number of emails. I think it might be about 2000 or something. So if you were gonna have fewer supporters than that, it's a great free tool uh, to utilize online. We also created a website. Um, and then we started the real crucial work, which was reaching out to members of the Portland City Council. The first thing we did was we met with the one supportive counselor that we could find who thought that this was a decent idea. He didn't think we had a chance of getting it passed, but he liked the idea. So he told us uh, what we needed to do was to craft an ordinance and give it to him and he would have it formally submitted to the city council to kind of kick off a legislative process. So we found a local expert um, who helped us tremendously in uh, drafting that first uh, sample ordinance. And um, we gave it to the counselor who submitted it to a subcommittee. And at that point, we were we were off. We, you know, the, the political process had begun. So what happens next? Well, that ordinance had been submitted. And immediately in response, uh, the city staff, which was and is the strongest and most effective opponent that we have had. Uh, the whole time through um, with this work, they drafted their own ordinance that codified the status quo. So the political fight uh, was definitely on. Um, so let's see. So now we're into the campaign. 
And we soon had people wanting to help. And one of the things, because we were just a volunteer-led organization of people who had other jobs and other responsibilities, and none of us were doing this full time, um, when we had volunteers and they wanted to do something, as long as it wasn't a completely you know, out there idea, we said, yes, please go do it. So we let people do what they could do. We got many people who testified at council hearings. Um, some people tabled at the farmer's market and at other events to get names of more people supportive of our effort. Um, some wrote letters to the editor. One person set up the website, uh, someone else de designed a full color flyer, an information flyer. Another person designed our lawn sign. Um, so I've got one of them right here. Uh, you can see it. These proved to be super popular and really effective. We, um, we contacted local markets and stores that were known for selling organic food and asked them if they would put a little jar on their counter near the checkout register with our signs saying, you know, please take a sign for a $10 donation. And people would put money in the jar and we would end up with more money um, than $10 per sign because people would put in additional donations. So these were really popular and uh, the challenge was keeping up with the demand. We couldn't keep up with it. There was way more demand for these signs than, than we had signs. So that was a good problem to have. People, people wanted these signs in their, in their front yards and in their gardens. Um, we got a grant to pay for the printing of the signs because they they were pricey. They're they're like political you know signs that you see in the fall. Um, another thing that was interesting, I guess, about the campaign is that a lot of volunteers came and went over the course of our work, and um, that was fine. We let people come and go, and just were grateful for whatever they could do during whatever time period. Um, one area that we paid a lot of attention to was our messaging. And let's see, so here's some, some initial messaging. Um, at first, when we first started out knowing nothing about how to pursue this, we began talking about pesticide free and banning pesticides. Now, that's fine and that's what we were after, but that's also a negative message. We're saying we don't want something instead of saying what we do want. So we quickly figured that out and knew that we could do better. And um, we realized it was more beneficial to advocate for a positive cause than a negative cause. So uh, so we, we switched up our, our messaging uh, to talk about organic and we campaigned uh, rather than for banning pesticides for the passage of a comprehensive organic land care ordinance. Um, and our messaging changed throughout the campaign and really depending on the audiences that we were speaking to, which varied from community groups to school groups to the city council itself. Um, and we needed different messages for all of those, sometimes the same message, but you know, we, we did tailor, tailor our message quite a bit. Um, but overall, our messaging really reflected the community values of the city that we're in. And um, this city values things like land stewardship, organic gardening was already going on all over the place in the city when we started our campaign. Uh, water protection is a big value here in a coastal city. Uh, pollinator per, uh, preservation already was another group advocating for pollinator protections and public health. So that's a lot of different um, groups potentially and, and messages, but we were talking about, about all, all those things. And so, you know, it's, it's really helpful to think about what your particular community values are that you can tie uh, to your campaign. So in general, our, our messaging, uh, focused on uh, eight talking points. Um, improved soil and water health. So this is this is the environmental message. This is about organic land care and what it offers. Uh, we focused on the science-based 
and knowledge-based practice of organic land care versus the product-based practice of conventional land care. Um, improve public health. So we were uh, running our campaign before the pandemic, but now we all live in a different world. And so, you know, public health, I, I would imagine is, is a pretty big concern for a lot of people. Uh, so we talked about that and we talked about the public health risks that are inherent in pesticides and are, are particularly risky for vulnerable populations such as children, pets, pollinators, waterways, aquatic animals, lobsters here in Maine um, are, are extremely susceptible to, to pesticides uh, during various stages of their life cycles. So we talked about, we talked about those issues. Now I mentioned that Portland and Maine in general are, are known for being hotbeds of, of organic uh, gardeners and uh, farmers. So we really talked about that. We talked about codifying the existing organic culture here in Portland. And um, one of the things that we did in terms of messaging on this is that we created a, a one sheet with a list of every single organic garden in the city. And we had a couple of pictures on it and we distributed that to the city council and other interested people. Um, the city's community gardens have always been organic as have its school gardens. And that is likely the case in a lot of communities. So seek out the, the schools managing the community gardens at the schools and, you know, it might be your parks department, whomever is managing community gardens. And those are often going to be organic by default. So, um, so seek those out as potential allies. Um, we also talked about pollinators a lot, and you can see they they played uh, a big role in our our image uh, image uh, and design work in terms of promote you know using a bumblebee as our um, kind of logo or branding. Um, people all over the place are waking up to the fact that there is a major collapse of the insect world going on. It's been called an apocalypse, and so the the shiny you know insects get get more love the the bees and the butterflies so fine go with that and talk about how these um creatures are directly harmed by synthetic pesticide use um this was a, an extremely effective talking point for us uh in portland so all right let's see that the other four that we talked about Raising the quality of life. Now, everyone wants a high quality of life, right? And most city uh, governments think that they're they're striving for that. So this is this is another good messaging point. Um, we argued that in dense urban areas, um, pesticide drift cannot be controlled, and so requiring the use of organic land care techniques and organic pesticides as a last resort, that raises the standard of living for everybody. Allowing synthetic pesticides to just drift about a community does not lead to a high quality of life. So, so that was an intriguing uh, messaging point that, that we worked on. Another one that we talked about is integrated pest management versus organic pest management. And we learned that we had to talk about this from the opposition because um, the, the opposition talks about integrated pest management as if that's the solution that uh, will solve all the problems that people like me bring to a city council. Well, that may sound good in a city council meeting, but it's not true. So what we talked about was that IPM is an old solution. It came out of the 1970s. It's 50 years ago now. It's nothing new about it. And in Maine, at least, all the applicators, all the pesticide applicators, conventional lawn care people, they all will tell you they adhere to integrated pest management. So they're already doing this. 
So if the solution is integrated pest management, but people are already using integrated pest management, that's not a solution. That's just a continuation of the status quo. So we talked about that and we really explained um, what that meant. And we talked about organic pest management as following similar protocols, but having a higher standard because if there is an issue where a pest reaches a threshold where you need to respond to it for some reason, well, then the tool that you would reach for is a less risky product because it is an organic pesticide. And again, that's a last resort. Homeowners aren't using any pesticides um, on their organic properties. Let's see, misinformation tactics. Okay, well, we talked about misinformation in our campaign because there was a huge amount of it. Uh, we called out the position, which in all of its communications included falsehoods, misinformation, and confusing assertions such as their favorite false talking point, which is that all pesticides are equally risky. That is untrue. They are all risky, but synthetic pesticides have pervasive long-term risks, while OMRI-listed pesticides, which are the ones that we refer to as organic, they don't linger in the soil for generations. So they all have acute risks, but it's the long-term risks that differ with, with, these, with these things. So these are lots of misinformation. It, it's effective sometimes if, if you know, people are uneducated, you can use misinformation uh, to, to really um, uh, you know, make, them, make them follow your reasoning. But we want to be on the side of truth and science. Finally, um, one another thing that we talked about is private property rights. Now, often that talking point is used by the opposition. It says, oh, look at these people who want to take away our right to spray our property with pesticides. They're stealing our property rights. All right, good argument. However, if you are living in an urban or a suburban development where the buildings and the properties are smushed right up against each other. You've got the issue of pesticide drift. You can't keep those pesticides on your property. They may rain, they may wash onto the neighboring property, they may drift in the wind. You know, insects and animals may, you know, drag them from one property to another. So when my neighbor uses pesticides and it drifts onto my property, my property rights have just been taken because I'm no longer controlling my property. My neighbor has infringed on my property rights. So that's another um, you know, interesting talking point that, uh, that we, we used in our campaign. And all these things that I bring up as talking points, the industry did not have a good response or an effective response to any of them. All right. So how did we get it done? Well, now we get into the nitty gritty of politics, local politics. So after the two ordinances were submitted to the city council, the mayor formed a task force to look into the issue. And So what I discovered with the formation of that task force is that task forces are where good ideas go to die. Now, the task force was a long project. I think it was like 11 months or something uh, that we had to labor on that. Um, I was one of the people appointed to it, but most of the task force members were pesticide applicators and people who supported the status quo. I was the only organic advocate on the on the whole task force. So after all these meetings of just the most ridiculous things being said and asserted, um, that task force ended up voting 10 to one in favor of this nonsense ordinance that was a pro-pesticide ordinance. It was really ridiculous. So it was a court of 10 to one. I was the one lone dissenter. There was a lot of pressure for me to vote in favor of it, but I was absolutely not going to vote in favor of that nonsense. 
And because I did not vote in favor of it, Portland Protectors was then able to uh, seek out another counselor who was sympathetic. And, and another context, during this whole time, the neighboring city of South Portland had been working on their ordinance and they passed it while the, the Portland task force was meeting. So that's super helpful. We now have the neighboring city has adopted legislation and um, legislative bodies such as city councils, town councils, they really appreciate legislation ordinances that have been vetted by another community and have been passed. It's not just you know some wild idea, it's real legislation that other communities have passed. So that was super helpful. Um, so the counselor we approached agreed that the South Portland ordinance was superior and she then reworked the South Portland ordinance to fit Portland city codes and presented it to the council. One little side note here is that as the years ticked by of our campaign, because we started in 2015 and the ordinance was adopted in 2018. So during that time, as volunteers were coming and going, the other people who were coming and going were the city council members. So we had to be really nimble and uh, we had to keep finding allies on the council. So this counselor who uh, rewrote the South Portland ordinance to fit the Portland codes was a new counselor who hadn't been there at, at the beginning. Um, so it's, you know, really helpful to keep looking for those council allies as, as there are new elections. So what were some of the things? There were, there were many hearings and, um, you know, parts of the legislative process that played out over time. Um, so the key thing was there were now these two ordinances, the task force ordinance and the, the South Portland ordinance. So those were presented to the city council to make a choice. What are we going to do? You know, ordinance A, ordinance B, or nothing. So one thing that we did uh, during the meeting when the counselors were going to consider this is we created a side-by-side -side sheet that looked at the qualities of each of the, uh, of the or of both of the ordinances and then all the um, provisions that they either included or didn't include. So we did that as a side-by-side -side handout and we put it on the desk of all the city councilors before they arrived in the council chamber. Then when they arrived, I saw all of them consult it and look at it and many of them referred to it in the later debate. So that that proved to be a, a real um, helpful thing. It wasn't anything fancy. It was just printed on an office computer, but it was the kind of information um, that was both, packed with information, but also easy to read. It wasn't dense verbiage. It was a chart that listed yes or no, it has this provision. So that was that was a helpful thing. Um, another tactic that we used at city council me uh, meetings was to print out name badges with a, a picture of the RB on it. And then all of our supporters who showed up would put a sticker on. And then even if they didn't uh, testify, the council could see them sitting there with the stickers. And so they got a sense of, um, you know, the, the strength of our support. And, you know, counselors are elected by voters. And so, you know, if you can turn out a lot of people, that indicates that there are a lot of voters who feel that way. Now, it's a shame that sexism is still a reality in our world today. But I'm sorry to say it is so. And so be prepared to meet it. We realized right away that uh, women's voices were not given the same amount of uh, credence that male voices are. So, OK, so we, we saw that this was was happening. And as a group led by two women, Portland protectors needed to be real savvy on this. So when it came time for public meetings, we arranged for letters and testimony from men of authority who understood organic land care. This was crucial since most of our supporters tilted toward female. We got as many as of our supporters as we could to testify and send letters, but we were very deliberate in uh, being sure to bring men from the business, 
the medical and the environmental communities to the council to testify. And their voices were super helpful in getting in getting this done. So finally, I would just say to everyone listening, be confident. Remember that your opponent's number one tactic is confusion. They will say all pesticides are the same. They will make organic land care sound difficult and the land care problems insurmountable. This is all false. You can combat their smoke and mirrors with science. Organic land care is about using knowledge to improve soil health, while conventional land care is about selling products to boost a company's profits. Every argument that was raised in every land care challenge mentioned during our campaign had a sound and scientifically backed solution already being used by organic land care practitioners such as Chip and Ben, who will speak next. Listen carefully to what they have to say because knowledge is power. Have confidence. You are on the side of science and common sense. You can do this. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to uh, speak to you all. And um, I look forward to any questions that uh, folks may have at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avery. And I, I could see from the chat how much people appreciate hearing your presentation and your experience. Um, we'll talk in the, the Q&A session about the ongoing relationship now with the Parks Department, which may have started with a bit of uh, contentiousness, but has now evolved to embracing the program uh, as good for the landscapers, the crews that work the public areas, as, as well as the community. Uh, and we see this in community after community where there's there may be resistance um, from the parks folks, and then um, an evolution to uh, embracing the program. And our next speaker is an example of somebody who didn't need much pushing um, because he himself uh, came to the uh, conclusion, uh, even before we showed up, uh, that something really needed to be done and should be done in the community. I wasn't quite sure what the that was, but Ben is the park. So ben Grattan is the park supervisor in the open space and uh, trails department for the city of Longmont, Colorado. Ben has been maintaining and transforming municipal landscapes across the Front Range for nearly 15 years, using his degree in landscape horticulture, Colorado State University. He supervises the management of more than 600 acres. Ben has managed pilot sites in Longmont, Colorado as part of the Beyond Pesticides Parks for Sustainable Future program. Um, this is a true collaboration. Ben, as you can see from his resume, brings tremendous skill uh, to this collaboration. He told the Longmont leader, quote, instead of using pesticides, Longmont selects turf grass with more aggressive rhizomes, underground stems, to compete weed seed, to outcompete, sorry, weed seeds, engages in more frequent core aeration and in overseeding to decrease weed pressure dramatically. So Ben, again, thank you for what you do and thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Jay. I will try to share my screen for everybody. Full screen, all right. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben. I am a uh, supervisor of work cultural operations at City of Longmont in Colorado. Uh, I was reviewing some of the um, people as you were logging in, and I noticed you're from all over the country, which is awesome. Uh, I will be focusing on uh, how we've done organic maintenance here in Longmont along the front range of Colorado, which might be a little bit different than uh, Oregon or the uh, southeast. But these these same principles all apply 
uh, able all over the U.S. Quick introduction: I've uh, been doing this uh, sort of work since I graduated from uh, CSU in back in '07. I've actually hopped around a couple different uh, government agencies uh, here in Colorado, but um, grew up here, uh, born and raised in Colorado, and I used to spend a lot of time with my mom out in the uh, garden, out in our backyard, and so that's you know from my interest in uh, plants and uh, insects. I used to go out and capture a bunch of them and keep them in jars in my bedroom, and uh, so I just always had an interest in being outdoors and uh, you know landscaping overall. So I was able to uh, luckily make a career out of this. And what I've seen over the last uh, few years, especially here in Longmont, is a uh, growing interest in uh, organic maintenance, pesticide-free maintenance, and water-wise uh, landscaping. Uh, out here in Colorado, uh, water is a huge issue. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, you know, Colorado uh, water up in the mountains feeds uh, many, many st states in the West. And so water uh, is a huge um, issue out here in the West. Um, so there's been a lot of interest in, um, you know, being able to keep our landscapes looking nice, but also, uh, you know, using uh, less water and uh, being efficient uh, that way. So I, I, I really got interested in uh, organic maintenance uh, on my own yard. Uh, purchased a home here in Longmont uh, about five years ago now, and uh, the previous homeowner had been doing a uh, five times a year synthetic fertilizer program, uh, weed and feeds, all that on the yard. And uh, after we purchased the house, I decided, you know, I'm going to try to make this a, a uh, World Wildlife, a wildlife uh, Foundation, you know, yard that it's all organic, pesticide-free, and see how hard it was. And uh, I found out actually is it's quite easy to do. And so I then took that concept and talked with um, people here in parks, and we were able to do test pilots on two of our parks with uh, Jay and Chip and uh, and get this up and running. So this is just a picture of my yard in uh, July of uh, 19. This is a year after I started the organic maintenance and there's not a weed in there. And uh, it's all based on cultural practices and I will be diving into that here in a minute. So just a little bit of history on these parks. Uh, there's two of them that uh, we picked uh, here in Longmont and uh, both are, are very iconic parks that are heavily used um, by the community and uh, uh, visitors. This first one is Roosevelt Park. It's, it's right smack in the middle of our city. It's uh, the oldest park that this city has. Uh, it used to be at one time a, uh, a horse track. That's why it's kind of oval in the middle. Uh, it used to be the, the county uh, fairgrounds. Uh, I used to have Baseball diamond out in the middle. It's it's gone through many transitions, but currently it's a it's a community park uh, about ten and a half acres. That middle area is about five of those acres. And there's a a war memorial garden on the west end. It's all roses, um, and then there's a senior center on the southwest, a recreation center on the southeast, and then that top middle. Is a, a is an ice rink during the winter, and then a big outdoor pavilion for festivals in the summertime. There's about four to six, eight festivals a year uh, with thousands of people out there. It's a lot of you know pressure on that turf to keep it nice. And then our other park that we did pile on was. Garden Acres. Uh, this is a a more sports complex uh, park. 
almost 15 acres total of turf. Um, as you can see there, it's got softball diamonds. It's got multi-use program fields on the east and west ends for soccer, football, stuff like that. And that cricket pitch on the north end, it's also a detention pond uh, for stormwater of all the neighbors. And so this park gets programmed for recreation uh, use for March, early March, all the way to the end of November. So if you're thinking about Colorado, it's, you know, basically have three or four uh, months without uh, use on them, but it's also during the winter time. So it's not easy to rehab uh, fields over the winter time here. So our focus on these is to really focus on turf health and having that be able to recover easily from all the use. So well, we started this program with Chip and Jay and uh, Osborne Organics and uh, Beyond Pesticides in 2019, uh, Chip was able to come out here and speak with us for a couple hours in person, and then we did some site visits of those parks, and uh, we took some samples of the soil to test for chemistry and for biologicals, uh, what's actually living in that soil. And so we were able to send those off and get baselines, and, and then we were gonna really dive into that in 2020. And then of course, as we all know, uh, early on that year, uh, there was a lot of struggles with uh, everything worldwide. And so we had to really you know, put a hold on projects and funding to see what our year would actually look like. But you know, as, as we kind of worked out of it and figured out the pandemic a little bit, at the end of that year, uh, we got back with Chip and we started looking at you know, what type of you know, fertilizer would we replace our synthetic that we had been using with? And so we were looking at, you know, different variations around here uh, locally to uh, try to replace that with cost effectively and actually, you know, be able to acquire enough of that to use here. And so that's what we worked on in 20. And then in 21, two, and then this year were the actual years of us doing the on on the ground work. And so uh, the first year and last year, especially we really uh, it went pretty hard at fertilizing those parks three times a year. So spring, summer, and then early fall. Uh, we used a rich lawn product that's just a local uh, a granular fertilizer that's out here available. Um, it's a chicken waste byproduct, so a feather meal and uh, chicken waste, stuff like that. It's actually it's sold uh, locally at you know, Lowe's and you know, all of those stores here uh, as well. And then we uh, upped our aeration. So this was the big uh, difference you know, from our conventional um, programs is we really stepped up how many times we aerated. So that middle area of Roosevelt and then uh, all the athletic areas, Garden Acres, we really we aerated uh, six times uh, last year and the first year in 21. And then we uh, did the whole rest of the park twice a year. And then uh, we overseeded our whole turf areas twice, spring and fall, uh, to go along with the aerations and uh, fertilizing. And so there are differences, you know, training out, uh, you know, organic and synthetic fertilizers, as many of you might uh, already know. Um, the main difference that you can see here is that it takes quite a bit uh, more actual uh, pounds of, of fertilizer. And that's because the, the nitrogen is so low uh, on our organic ones typically. So to get that 
pound of nitrogen per acre, or you actually have to use physically almost triple the amount of of what you need, and so or of what uh, synthetic is. But uh, yeah, so then uh, what that actually means is you're applying it you know multiple times a year as opposed to once a year, um, and that equates out to be about two and a half times the cost. And so we we paid a contractor to purchase the fertilizer for us and apply it. So that's why you know this cost is a little bit higher. We'll talk about that in a minute of how you can possibly offset these higher costs. But takeaway here is that it does take a lot more actual product uh, if you're using a granular uh, like the ones we were using. So people always ask, well, if it's triple or two and a half times the amount, you know, obviously I can't actually do that. You know, if we have a, a set budget like most governments do, you know, how can you possibly do that? So what we found is you can, you know, you can offset uh, labor. Uh, if you're already doing, a, you know, broadleaf or pre-emergent, or we can control out in those turf areas, all that labor, all that material is it's not equivalent, but you can start taking the you know those and and uh, offsetting that that cost of that additional fertilizer for their organic use. Uh, the other piece of it is if you hire it out or if it's in house, uh, uh, that's a huge cost savings if you're able to do it in house. You know if you own the equipment, if you have the staff to do it, it's obviously way cheaper than if you're hiring a company that has to come out and tack on uh, profit and you know all their you know, overhead and all that on top of uh, everything that they're doing. So another piece of that is is that uh, inputs actually gradually decrease over the years. So year one, we fertilized three different times. We aerated six times and we seed twice. And last year we did only five uh, aerations, and this year we only did three aerations. So each each year we've gone down and not seen a drop off in our quality of our turf out in these parks. And the last piece of this is, uh, I'm hoping to be looking into this next year is trying trying different uh, fertilizer types. Uh, you know, there's liquid, there's you know additives, there's granular. You know, all the different types of products in the way that you actually apply them, we hopefully can find a cheaper product out there to use. So takeaway of all of this is that it is not a, oh, I used to fertilize with, you know, whatever uh, we didn't feed every year, I'm just going to trade that out for organic and I'm good. It's really about soil health. And so this is you know, cultural practices that, that go hand in hand with that organic product. And so what we've found out is if you know you do your proper uh, cultural practices, that fertilizer is actually just an additional help. Uh, really, it's all about you know getting your soil health uh, increased, and then that that organic fertilizer is kind of that back end of it. So uh, we've found that if you have you know, healthy soils, this allows your turf, your grasses to handle stress more and out compete weeds, which is a huge part of this. As everybody always assumes, if you're organic only, you're gonna have a whole bunch of weeds and that's not true at all. If your turf is healthy, if your soil is healthy, your turf is healthy, and then you don't have as many weeds and uh, other uh, diseases that you know, I know are big in other areas of the country. Uh, so you know, out here, especially if your grass is healthier, your soil is healthy, it's able to uh, retain water better. It's actually more uh, drought tolerant. 
And then a big key out here is we don't have a lot of budget, extra budget to do extra uh, moans each week. And so in the spring, if you tie that synthetic fertilizer, you usually have that big flush of uh, growth uh, each week. And then you're technically supposed to be just mowing that uh, twice a week and not cutting off more than a third of the grass height at, at one mowing. Uh, using organic fertilizer and, and this type of program, it really helps ease that gradual uh, growth and, and cleanup up in the spring. And you don't have as much of that, that harsh cutting off, you know, half of that height per mowing. So the takeaway is really spend your effort on uh, aeration. It's, it's key to this program. I'll show you some pictures here next of, if you're not able to aerate, it dramatically uh, impacts the program. So core aerations, especially out here in the uh, in Colorado, we have a really heavy uh, clay soils. If you add water and then people or weight on top of that, it'll pack that down. And then your roots uh, aren't able to grow as well. Turf isn't as healthy. Then in come the weeds, and then it looks like your program is failing. So core aeration, uh, overseeding that fertilizer because that grass till needs it, and you're feeding the the um, you know, all the, the organisms in the soil. Which is actually helping your your turf be healthy. And the and the last piece of it is really work on acquiring high quality seed. Uh, this may not be what you find at Lowe's or uh, Ace Hardware. Uh, it could be, it should be from a local. Um, uh, we have about five of them here in Colorado. Companies that all they do is deal with high quality seed and they uh, provide seed to the Broncos and Rockies and all those other programs that that, that want high quality turf uh, for their programs. So just quickly here, a couple of successes and challenges. This is real world things we've had over the last couple of years. Out in our, our rose garden, uh, it's, a, it's a very intricate park on the, on the uh, west end. As you can see, there's these raised uh, rose beds out there, tight and narrow walkways. And so that means that you have to have more specialized uh, aerators, uh, seeders, uh, able to fertilize it with smaller equipment, which takes a lot more uh, manpower to do that. And so if you don't do it as often as you should, uh, this is what you end up with. You, you can see a little bit of plantain down here on the south end of the picture, a little bit of uh, clover, which is it a weed or not? That's, that's a lot of, you know, a debate on that. But uh, this is a uh, lower nitrogen, uh, is what this tells you. So what we've found out is that you're out in the middle area where there's nothing to, to have to go around. It's much easier to uh, aerate more efficiently, uh, and fertilize efficiently. We didn't have any Danny Lyons out there. I know it's a huge issue out here in the West is Danny Lyons is another weed, which is also debatable, but uh, uh, we didn't have any of those type of weeds out in this area. And we haven't been spraying it, uh, any of our turf or doing any pre on any of this since I took over in 2017 here. And so um, this just shows you, you know, as you get into these, these harder areas to get in and out of, it, it ups the you know labor it takes and equipment possibly that it takes to do this. Uh, and if you're over at Garden Acres, uh, which is a lot of you know your big athletic areas, it's wide open athletic areas. There's no trees around. There's no, there's no benches. There's nothing to get in and out of. So here we're able to use a a giant tow behind uh, aerator on a tractor. It's six feet wide. Uh, we can do the whole park in a couple hours. 
it's really easy to do, which then people also do it more often. That's just how it is. You know, if you have a small write on one, it takes you a day and a half to do it. Staff isn't as, uh, you know, then it's ready to hop out there and, and do that. There's other things that they're supposed to be doing as well. So big open areas is much easier. Um, you don't have as many um, uh, uh, weeds and, and pressures out there because of you know, how open it is and, and how easy it is to, uh, to maintain. Now, there are you know, weeds out there. Just a just a matter of you know, what your level of tolerance is. And so if you look out here, in, in my opinion, that's a very nice government public use uh, recreation softball field, and uh, I'd take that as an awesome field any day. So this is actually taken back in August of this year, and so I know extra water you know, to set this picture up or anything. I just went out there on just a typical day after we mowed and snapped a picture. And uh, what's nice is the the drought tolerance we've had, you know, of this soil and, you know, of this program is is just unbelievable. We actually have been able to save water use um, by going to all our uh, organic maintenance in these parks. I uh, just quickly here, I just want to toss out a couple of related projects that don't tie directly into our CAG meetings, but um, just another couple of the highlights here for Colorado and what we're doing out here is uh, this is Kensington Park, and this is a um, turf conversion project. It's a it's a it's kind of a hot topic out here right now with you know the water use and uh, you know, trying to change out unused turf areas to more functional things. And so this is a nice program here. Uh, this is a collaboration of eight departments in the city of Longmont, which if any of you work in government, you know that's, that's a, a miracle to get eight uh, different groups working on one project. And so we were able to reach out uh, to this community, uh, this art piece was built in the 1990s, and it had been starting to get hit by mowers and starting to uh, show signs of wear. And so we had a, a meeting with our uh, director here at the city, and we decided, hey, let's pull all this turf out and let's make a pollinator xeric garden that after a couple of years uh, uses no water. And so this is a cool project we had uh, all the neighbors come out the bottom right photo that we had about 80 people come out we enticed them with ice cream and uh planting and they came out and they planted every plant out there and now they're gonna uh keep that that up for the next couple of years so that's a fun project there and then uh, lastly another uh, thing that's happening out here is is just trying to look at you know high use uh, um, I'm sorry uh, low use but high input turf areas that you can start changing out uh, so we have a lot of turf as Jay had mentioned is about 480 acres of turf that I manage and easily half of that is not used by the public at all and so we're working on a program of changing out uh, it, those areas over to uh, drought tolerant uh, grasses. So uh, a couple years back, we killed off all this turf in July. Then we over, uh, we aerated it, overseed it uh, with a wheat grass blend. We quadrupled the normal rate that you would in like a native area. So this actually starts you know, looking like turf, but it uh, requires half the water and half the mowing. And then if you really let it just take off, uh, you can just mow it uh, once a year and uh, water it only in July and August. And uh, it's the way that we're really trying to you know, think about our public spaces and how much your water we're using, inputs we're using, uh, how much we're mowing, which has emissions, 
and you know all that whole dynamic of of maintaining our our uh, public lands uh, out here in Longmont. But uh, that is all I had. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, if you need to get hold of me, uh, feel free to email, uh, and I'll look forward to your our questions here at the end. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ben, and um, thank you for what you're doing and your leadership. It's it's just phenomenal, and look forward to the Q and A at the end of this. Um, we'll now move on to Chip Osborne. Uh, many of you know Chip. Uh, if you don't, you'll look forward to meeting him soon, hopefully in a community near you. Um, Chip is a nationally renowned organic turf grass expert and a professional horticulturist nearly, with nearly 50 years experience, including 20 years in the greenhouse uh, business, greenhouse production, as the former owner and operator of Osborne Florist and Greenhouse in Marblehead, Massachusetts. As founder and president of Osborne Organics in Cape, now in Cape Nettick, uh, Maine, he has over 20 years experience in in creating safe, sustainable, and healthy athletic fields and landscapes that are managed cost-effectively with organic practices across the US. Um, the other really interesting thing about Chip is that he served in an elective position on his on Marblehead's uh, Recreation Parks Commission for 20 years. So when Chip goes out and talks to a community, he's talking both as a practitioner and understanding how public policy is made and the budgeting process uh, is always a point of discussion. So Chip, I turn it over to you. Thanks for being here today, appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. So my role today is going to talk about the big picture and I call it choices and challenges. In the first two, segments of this year's forum, you heard about uh, choices that we have to make and the science that is guiding us now into understanding that the time is here to begin to, you know, accept and make the right choice. And then the challenge is how do we do it in the real world by developing programs and methodologies that are going to achieve our goals. Uh, as Jay mentioned, I've been a professional horticulturist for 50 years, 25 years as a licensed chemical applicator, and the most recent 25 years as an organic practitioner and consultant. 20-year uh, chairman of the Recreation and Park Commission and have and worked nationally as an organic educator, consultant, and lecturer. Um, I began all of this back in the mid nineties as an, as an advocate. Uh, I, at the time I was having my greenhouse business and I was still using chemicals. And I realized that that was taking me in a path I didn't want to go. So I first transitioned my own business. And then I teamed up with uh, a colleague in my town of Marblehead and we formed an advocacy group, Marblehead Pesticide Awareness Committee. And within a couple of years, we engaged the Board of Health. And within two years after that, we had the country's first organic pest management policy. Uh, unlike what Avery did, we could not restrict the homeowner because preemption laws exist in Massachusetts, but we were able to restrict what happened on town owned land. And that has since become, since 2001, a policy and then 2005 regulation. Um, so here it was, we had this, this policy in place. I had run for, uh, the park board was elected and now it was my job to transition 20 acres of athletic field, something I had never done. Uh, I took all 20 acres all at once, no pilot project and began to convert everything to natural management. First time it had been done on that scale. Our policy didn't just prohibit pesticides, it mandated a thoughtful organic approach. So I was known in the community as an elected official and an advocate. Failure wasn't an option. I had bared myself to the community and said, we're gonna follow the science and this will work. 
So we're, we're talking about this subject and we talked a little bit about why human health and environmental concerns. Advocacy, like Avery's, is driving the change. Practitioners like Ben beginning to implement organic practices are going to codify that change for the future. Avery is a shining example of what can happen uh, at the local level. Uh, she is one of the best I've ever come across in my 25 year career of doing this, an effective communicator as you have just seen um, and really knew what she wanted that message to be and how to communicate that message to others to get the desired results. Ben is probably one of the best I've ever worked with in the country. He's at the point where he can take over for me tomorrow. Uh, he got it from the beginning. He understands the science. He understands the program. And most importantly, as you heard him talk, soil is the key to it all. You know, we, when we focus on the soil, as Ben did, he got that part of the message from that very first training that he referenced. And from then, he's done this on his own. He's taken it to himself. He's refined it to be site-specific there in Longmont and um, produced incredible results. So what we're talking about is an alternative management protocol. You can see those four words up there natural, organic, sustainable, regenerative, all different words, all words that people to use to describe what we're talking about. But the only one up there that is defined is the word organic. Organic is defined at the federal level and that created organic agriculture. Natural, sustainable, regenerative, not defined. Regenerative is the new buzzword, but if we are truly managing organic to the definition of the word, we are in essence being regenerative. We're talking about the adoption of a systems-based approach versus a product approach. Problem solving, not symptom treating. It's important to remember that all the pesticides that are sold to us treat symptoms none of them solve underlying problems. It's the cultural practices and the overseeding that Ben talked about that are the problem solving part of the strategy. The creation of a healthy biologically active soil environment, critically important. What we are not talking about as Avery mentioned is integrated pest management. And that has been pushed back at us all these years that we don't need organic management because we have integrated pest management. Unfortunately, IPM, which was developed in academia back in the 70s and 80s, has been changed in the modern age to, to talk about what we call an IPM toolbox and pesticides are in that toolbox. When we are managing organically, we certainly have some pesticides that we are allowed to use that we call organic compatible, but they are restricted. So organic IPM restricts the material that can be used. So we have taken much of the gold standard IPM and gone that much further. The most important thing is we are not swapping product. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, when people decided they wanted to try an organic lawn. They simply looked at all of the products that they determined were no longer acceptable and swapped them out for something that was more desirable. That will fail every single time. A good example is if you want to do an organic lawn or a natural sports field and you try to switch fertilizers uh, to organic and then bring in the cultural practices, but decide organic fertilizer might be too difficult to use and continue to use synthetic, you will fail. So we're really not dealing with product, although as you can see in the marriage of three concepts, product is certainly part of it. Number one is the soil biological life, and that's not number one by accident. Cultural practices, number two, because they are that important and need to be elevated in their priority, 
And then three is the exclusive use of natural organic product inputs. When we are choosing product, we are choosing it 50% to meet the immediate needs of the grass. The other 50% is to improve the biological health of the soil. Organic support sustainability action plans, all of these things on the left, all are results of organic management, sequestering carbon, eliminating fossil fuel products and processes, eliminating synthetics. Do you know that it takes five ton of petrochemical equivalent to produce one ton of 4600 urea? That goes away in organic management. We're looking to reduce input overall, recycle organic waste, reduce irrigation, save water, embracing plant diversity, and most importantly, creating and protecting habitat. In all of these areas, we can find long-term cost savings. So if we're in a municipality, that's a big deal. Anytime we can save costs, and we're projecting out you know, three to five years and then beyond into the future, being able to show <clears throat> reduced management cost. <clears throat> so a little bit about this whole thing of, of organic land care. It's happening nationally now in the United States. I, there's, there's really nowhere where this discussion is not happening. And you know, Jay can test to that by the Sustainable Parks Program through Beyond Pesticides and the requests that come in. It certainly began in the Northeast in the late 90s, early 2000s, quickly spread to the Mid-Atlantic, west of California, the Southeast, Southwest, Middle America, Hawaii, internationally, Australia, Great Britain, Western Europe, Canada should be up there. Uh, so that this is a subject that is getting attention around the world because we have practices and protocols in place that can produce the desired results. So there certainly are challenges. We're not going to say that this is not a program that doesn't have its challenges. The title of my talk is Choices and Challenges. Soils can be a challenge, water, climate, different regions of the United States, and they all have different issues. Soils can range from sandy loams uh, in the northeastern part of the United States with 5% organic matter or greater and 48 inches of rainfall to soils in the southwest where organic matter can be 2% or less, uh, minimal rainfall, clay contents change, sand contents change. With all of this variability, that does not mean that organic land management cannot happen. And that's one of the things that gets pushed back at us all the time, especially by industry, is that you can't do it. it it's not going to work in different regions of the country. Yes, it may work in New England, but it's not going to work here in the Southwest. It's not going to work in Texas or Florida. Through our programs and our management levels in different regions of the country, we're now showing that it can be done. One of the things that happens with organic management is we are site specific. Unlike the four-step program, which some of you may be familiar with, which is a corporate uh, produced fertility program and, 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 and herbicide control program where you buy bags at certain times of the year based on a calendar date, and when you think about it, you have 25 or 30 states where the same bags are sold, the same materials in the bags, widely different soils, widely different climates, but the same thing happens everywhere. And that's what we call cookie cutter. The value in organic management is that we deal with a site-specific nature. If it's Colorado, we deal with that. If it's Florida, we deal with that. If it's Arizona, we take all of that into account. That's really the key to making it work on a national level, especially in a place like the United States, where we have such diverse geographic regions and climates, you know, all within one country. You probably heard that it can't be done outside of New England. You know, Jay and I have heard that for years. Yes, it might work like that picture in Massachusetts on the right, 
uh, and, and that picture there was the first field that I started in 2001. So this has now been 100% organic for 22 years. And that's a pretty recent picture. So just like Ben's picture, we may find a little bit of clover in there on close inspection because that's within the footprint of a public park uh, that's been there for 75 years. And it was never a mandate to get rid of clover. We have other fields where there is there is no clover. It, it just is not there. So it really is, again, about dealing with things in site specific. But over on the left, now we have a Bermuda grass field in Southern California. This was a field that was built conventionally. We were brought in as consultants to a large HOA. Uh, and th this was part of our mandate was to do athletic fields as well as common uh, passive areas. This is Bermuda grass breaking dormancy, Southern California, probably in April, more or less. And as you can see there, th th we don't have any weeds here. We're in the third year of transition. It was newly constructed, relatively poor soil. So we had to uh, we had to do that. Water, this is watered with reclaimed water. So another one of the challenges uh, some regions of the country have reclaimed water, others have potable water. So this is Southern California, dry conditions, uh, reclaimed water. And yet by systematically looking this at this in a site-specific nature, relying on soil tests, relying on water tests, we're able to produce that kind of a Bermuda grass playing field. Fear of failure. One of the quotes that I came up with a long time ago is, is this quote here, and I firmly believe that, that the most limiting factor in more widespread adoption is that people just don't know how to do it. You still, in 2023, cannot go to a land-grant university and get any comprehensive education in organic land management. There is some... Uh, movement now to incorporate a little bit, but as of five or six years ago, they never even had a full uh, two or three classes devoted to organic fertilizers and how they work. Organic fertilizer was just referenced in passing as another kind of fertilizer. At all the land grants and the research facilities where the National Turf Evaluation Program tests out product, it's all synthetic. At my own university in Massachusetts, I asked the question, have you ever worked with insoluble nitrogen? And they, oh yes, and they came up with the chemical version of it. And I said, no, 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 I mean natural organic. And the answer was, no, we're not interested in that. So here we are with a, with a situation of the need for education, uh, but not able to find it at the large turf schools. So some of us are working on that to try to bring that level of education forward uh, and ramp up the ability of people to do this. So one of the fears of failure is if I try organic, if I stop my herbicides, if I stop my grub control, if I stop all of this stuff, insects and weeds will take over. They're going to destroy my field and within, within a short two years, it's going to be, just, you know, it's going to be not playable. So you see a couple of weeds here. You, you see a, a, a root feeding insect here as the, as the white grub. I can tell you from 25 years of experience, it does not happen. That picture you saw of that first field that I did, we had one minor grub outbreak in 23, 22 years, and we easily controlled it with beneficial nematodes and clove oil, uh, uh, cedar oil. So it was uh, the kind of a thing that a little bit of a problem came out. There was a challenge. We addressed it with organic practices and products and we solved it. So we solved the underlying problem and the symptom went away. It is a transition process and there are expectations that we have. Uh, this was probably one of the more dramatic projects I ever had. Uh, and this is Boulder, Colorado. And that first picture there, this is Greenleaf Park. And it was brand new and it was less than two years old and it looked like picture number one there. And they couldn't figure out what was happening. And 
we were working on other properties in town and they weren't even going to do anything here because they decided it was so bad. And I convinced them to, hey, let's just give it a shot. You can see the first coring tool and, and the, the core, that's as far as we could go down. It's all thatch, it's unhealthy. You can see in four, five, and six, the weed pressure, the lack of turf density, a very basic program of overseeding, aeration, and organic fertilizer. And within two years, we produced pictures seven and eight. So that is going from something that they were considering taking it all up and redoing it to then just switching out to organic, regulating irrigation, loosening the soil, creating oxygen in there, good pore space. So we changed that system from favoring weeds and uh, and challenged turf to a system that favored the turf grass and discouraged weeds. Expectations, we all need to set the expectation that we want and Ben talked about that. Expectations can be low, medium or high. So if they don't, uh, that doesn't mean that low is bad and high is good. It's the right expectation that we have for that site. It's also important when we look at expectations in the big picture that you have to remember that expectations that we have in the United States for turf generally, meaning residential, sports turf, public parks, were largely created by industry in the 1950s to sell product. It was selling that product as an herbicide when we were convinced that clover was a bad guy and take it out of there. And then they had synthetic water soluble nitrogen, ammonium nitrate to sell us when we lost the nitrogen from the clover. So that monoculture of turf grass was created as an expectation by industry in the 1950s. So myths, these are myths that I've run up against for the last 25 years. And one of the things that you know we've been able to do is simply take these things one at a time and, you know, at, as Avery mentioned, and dispel them and, and push back on these myths. And a lot of these myths, they all had their origins in the early and mid 2000s from the conventional industry, because the conventional industry was threatened that we were having a situation where organic was beginning to get a little bit of piece of the pie. It's too expensive. I can't afford it. It doesn't work. Everything will deteriorate. My fields get used too heavily. Organic will not perform. I have never worked yet in 25 years on a field that does not get heavy use. You need to shut down and rest when using organic methods. I have never worked on a property where the field has been closed and rested so that organic had a, change to, had a chance to work. When you push back against the industry with a sound response to all of these questions, they have no comeback because there is no comeback to this. The fact is that it's not too expensive. Cost to, to decrease over time. It does work. Parks and fields do not deteriorate. There's enough proof out there now to show that. So we're not talking about organic by neglect. We're talking about a thoughtful, proactive approach to management, a management that practice or, or protocol that is founded in science. Let's look at the cost side of it. We make it work within existing budgets. Unlike a four-step program, there is not just one uh, organic program, but we are able to customize an organic program based on budget. If we're not doing much conventionally and we begin organic, it may be more expensive. If we're not aerating and now we know we need to aerate, there's an increased labor and an increased cost. The reality in any conventional turf management program, we should be aerating, but we oftentimes don't because the herbicides are used to kill the weeds caused by compaction. And then soluble fertilizers are used to give a short-term stimulus to the grass. So it's all relative to what we have in place. But we look at the money that's allocated to the conventional management and then move that over to an organic column and work within that. Cultural intensity is the cost of inputs plus labor plus water, uh, and that becomes the cost of the program. 
when we are moving through transition, budget and cost determines how quickly we can move. If I have a, a deeper budget, I can move through transition more quickly because much of the first year is spent simply on fixing and adjusting soils that have largely been neglected, improving the biological life. So budget, cost, and transition are all related. If we don't have a lot of budget, can we get to where we want to be? Absolutely, we can. It may take an extra year or two. Transition period for municipal turf is generally thought of in, in a term of around three years. Uh, residential uh, back lawn, front lawn, usually a year and a half. So we begin with a pilot project, start small. We learn new practices, protocols, product inputs, education. A little bit of advice. If, if this is something that you are thinking of doing, don't pick the worst property. Jay and I get some properties. They give us the absolute worst in the city and say, okay, you can play with this one. I can tell you that you cannot expect a routine maintenance program, either conventional or organic, to renovate. So if you give me a property that's 35 or 40% weeds and 10 or 15% bare spots with a minimal budget for organic and expect that to be turned into uh, maximum turf density at 5% minus weed pressures per acre, it's not going to happen. So we have to be realistic. So pick a property that's already in good condition because it, it will not deteriorate and you'll find it will be much easier. Then as you become more comfortable with your efforts, you can expand it to other properties within the city. It can be done on any scale, large scale residential on the left, debatable whether you know that kind of a monoculture needs to happen in this day and age. But the bottom line, that is being produced without synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Smaller scale residential, everything you see here has been organic for 20 years or more and everything is fine and everything is thriving. So natural settings, nature takes care of creating healthy soil in these situations. In managed environments that we're dealing with and talking about today, all these normal functions and interactive functions are interrupted and often damaged our job becomes trying to restore some of that. That's more easily imagined than implemented. The healthy functioning of soil arises when plants, microbes, and soil inhabiting animals all work together because they actively participate in building and sustaining their environment. So this becomes the large thrust of our initial focus. Soil biological light, I can't stress, that's not what's taught in turf schools. It, we're taught about fertilizers, we're taught about products. Minimal is spent on biological life. All different species of organisms all participate to help create and maintain soil structure, oxygen in the soil, water infiltration, plant growth, nutrition, disease resistant, nutrient availability. Microbes are at the heart of all of this. This is an emerging concept where we're taking the biological aspects of soils and putting it on equal footing with the chemical aspects. Very different than what most of us were taught back in the day. It can be challenging. It includes factors that have a direct and indirect bearing on soil fertility. We have to understand that mineral soil can't be healthy by itself. We have to have the microbial fraction. Success in organic lawn and, and turf management. Microbes contribute the largest part of that. So active microbial populations is natural nitrogen production. The more nitrogen we can produce by organisms interacting with each other, the less we have to buy from a bag. Solubilizing the mineral nutrients that are already in soils, rather than go out and buy them, Microbes, as part of their normal function, chelate or solubilize existing soil minerals, and we're improving water holding capacity. As it is now, with what we know in the 25 years we have invested in this, and you know, all of the information that 
folks like Avery have put together and are using to educate homeowners and elected officials and all of Ben's hands-on work and doing it, you know, sort of just grabbing the bull by the horns, we now know that it can be done. It's interesting that conventional management claims the science. That was always thrown in my face. We're science-based. We have laboratories. We create all this stuff in laboratories, and we know the best way to manipulate nature and grow grass. I can assure you that organic management is every bit founded in science, and we are simply following the science of the natural world. I was addressing a bunch of golf course uh, superintendents at one point, and I said, the difference is you work with salespeople that represent science to try to manipulate things and to kill things. But I work with science to try to grow things and foster healthy communities of natural soil organisms. Moving forward, the most important thing that we can do is to empower people with the confidence that this works, that it's not a gamble, that it's not something that if we turn our back on what we've taught, been taught, and move in a different direction that we can't be successful. Advocates and practitioners each have their role to play. And moving forward, that is probably the most important thing with advocates and practitioners coming together for a common goal. The common goal of being able to show that natural management is successful, organic management, organic products can take the place of synthetics, better for human health, better for the environment, and will produce the desired results that we're all after. Thank you, Chip. Really appreciate your lifelong commitment to this. And it, it really, I think we're bearing fruit now on what is, is going on. Um, you know, what you've shared and is now going on at the community level effectively. So if we could bring the speakers all on screen, I think we'd like to open up the Q&A portion of this. Um, we're getting a lot of very interesting questions. Thank you guys again. Um, you know, they, they're in different areas of, of your work, both from the advocacy at public education side, and then on the technical side of how you put this together, um, you know, one of the, let's start Avery with the question of what is needed to put an ordinance together. Now I should say before, I, I would also add to that question, whether you ever considered beginning a pilot before passing the policy. And if somebody's sitting now listening to this and they're thinking, well, I, I can't get a policy passed or take might take a while, I don't have the resources, Maybe I can get a pilot going in my community. Do you have thoughts on that? And you know, if you do go the policy route, uh, can you explain a little bit more about the need for a lawyer in that process? Or do we have enough uh, model language now that can be used by other communities? All right, you want me to take that one? Yes, um, if you could. So in terms of, of an attorney, um, we didn't work with one. We just found somebody who knew pesticide ordinances and had worked with ordinances. Um, so ordinances, they're nothing mysterious. They're just really boring documents uh, that are written about the law. So anybody can be an expert on them. If you read a whole bunch of them, you'll suddenly become an expert on, on these ordinances. So we found somebody who knew these and he wrote us a draft ordinance. Um, and the draft ordinance was the most amazing thing. If we had ever passed it, it would be, it would be super, but you know, we, we got, you know, a compromise is, is what we got in the end, which was still, still awesome. So I think that, um, you know, look for nowadays, there are so many ordinances that have been passed. So if you can find one from your, your, your same state, that's going to be the most helpful, but finding anything that uh, a legislative body, a council has adopted is going to be, um, effective and helpful um in terms of um in terms of uh pilot projects we didn't do that in portland but we already had as i mentioned all these organic gardens that were being maintained in the city so in a way those were kind of a pilot project um 
you know, the, the, the real, the real sticking point is what Chip has been addressing. And that is the high performance fields, the turf fields. That's where, you know, all our issues in Portland, you know, really surround it. It's not the homeowner. It's not a gardener. You know, they don't want these, you know, things anyways. It's people who have, you know, are, are maintaining a performance landscape. Um, so so that's that's where the issues come in. And if you could get your town to do a demonstration, athletic field or park or playground, great. You know, that that's there's that is wonderful. Yeah. And I should say for those um, participating today, we've gotten tremendous support to underwrite these programs from Natural Grocers, which is operating in 161 market areas in 20 states. So look up their directory. And if you're in a Natural Grocers area, you're going to get high priority for us jumping in and helping out, uh, providing some of the underwriting uh, to make sure you get a plan together and so forth. Those funds can also be supplemented by other um, you know, businesses in the community that want to see this type of project get off the ground. It's good for children's health, for pets, for waterways. Um, so bringing the funds together, funds should not be an issue to get these programs off the ground. Um, maybe, Ben, you can speak to that in terms of your initial uh, concerns about cost when we first when we first started the program. Yeah, it was it was um, obviously, you know, an issue uh, with what budget uh, parks has, you know, to set budget every year. And it was just about and we didn't know how much you know, extra it would cost us. So we are you know, we'd already had that budget for synthetic fertilizing and type of operation in those parks. We just used that and we and we also shifted over um you know a small amount of funding but all the all the aeration all that labor all the extra seating was all done in-house so really you know, we're paying the staff you know anyway to be there and so it was you know, having them do the extra work and having other people cover the type of work that they weren't able to do then and uh you know you know did all that actually work yeah. So, yeah. so at you know what what we can offer beyond pesticides is the underwriting to bring in a horticulturalist and do the initial soil evaluations and put together the the plan. Um, the other company that has been very active in this is or um, you know Stonyfield Organic, uh, which has also been extremely helpful. Um, but in New York City, when we began this project another grocery chain uh, jumped into the fray because they saw this as an opportunity, you know, to basically support a worthwhile community community effort. Um, so I know there are a lot of issues out there around cost. And um, I guess what Ben just said is our general approach to this. If we provide the underwriting to bring in the technical resources to advise and collaborate, and the city then evaluates how they can shift some of the money they're already spending to manage that field into the organic. Chip, would you say you normally see um, an ability to use that existing budget uh, under an organic program? Yeah, it, it, exactly. What budget, and, and a lot of it depends upon the intensity. And some municipalities prioritize, you know, their grass areas, and others don't. But if there is a reasonable conventional program in place, that money then it gets shifted to, you know, the organic side, you know, we depending on where we are with soils. And that is that's the variable, you know, all around. So we may find in that first couple of years, there could be a 15 percent increase in cost. But we absolutely know that cost level and then decline in time. And Ben's got so much time invested in this now that he's probably able in another year to begin to take that big number of poundage of, of granular fertilizer and begin to drop that down. 
so that when we look at out over five years, we become cost neutral for sure or, or cost savings. Yeah. We are, we have gotten uh, several questions on stress. Uh, obviously use of the field. I know the the Roosevelt field there in Longmont, um, that's one of those fields where you have community events, folks drive on the field with their cars, you've got Please. tents, you've got a lot of activity there. What? How do you address the stress question and what's your experience now with organic in response to that? Yeah, it's, you know, uh, luckily parks you know, helps coordinate that that um, does events with recreation. And then as soon as that is done on that, that next Monday morning, it's core aerating uh, exactly where, you know, where everybody was, uh, overseeding it straight into it, even if you don't uh, need that seed in there at all. It's to add in the extra seed that will take three to four weeks, you know, to germinate and, and root and come up so it's always you know adding in the extra seed core aerating you know all the traffic and all the driving on those uh park areas and just always staying on top of that and trying to to press in the window of of you know stress on that turf out there yeah yeah um chip i know you get this question a lot also related to stress um, especially when you go to the more southern climates where there's a longer periods of uh, in-use fields, um, as opposed to New England where, you know, the field may be under snow or out of play during part of the year. Um, how do you deal with, you know, locations where the climate is such that the fields are in play all year round? So that when you get that kind of constant wear and tear, the probably one of the bigger differences is that down there, when you get that play around the calendar year, you're generally playing on Bermuda grass, which is a very short cut grass with a, a thatch layer. So at the end of the period of play, whether it may be that 10 months or whatever that play is, for those last couple of months, you're playing on the thatch layer. Um, it's no longer green blades of grass you're playing on, but you're playing on that brownish thatch layer. That doesn't mean you're playing on bare soil. Uh, that means that, you, you know, you, you, you've worn the blades down, but the thatch is there. And in fact, a lot of times the play actually improves on a thatch layer because it's a faster field. Then you, you have some period of time and all of the warm season regions have some period of time for recovery then it's it, it's working to come up with the best organic recovery program to bring that thatch back again. In other words, to bring that back into active growth, you know, for the next plague. And it varies anywhere from, you know, the Carolinas to Central California, all the way down to the Deep South. The timing is different, but again, it's the site-specific nature and you know, the ability to put down nitrogen in the right amounts at the right time in the right form to stimulate that recovery. Right. And again, this is something that also, as you pointed out, goes to species of grass. And, you know, when you get on a site and you're evaluating methods of managing um, can you combine species, uh, say rye and Bermuda or, you know, other types of grasses that uh, in some of the climates allows you some flexibility? You you can. you it, it, Unlike the cool season grasses where we have Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass and tall fescue, and they can be used in combination with each other in many different ways. Bermuda grass is a monoculture. So you can only grow that. But down in the deeper south, what they do, when I go from South Carolina down, what they'll do is they'll overseed Bermuda grass with a transitional rye grass right through Southern California so that during the winter time when Bermuda grass goes dormant, they have a green field to play on. So now you have green because with Bermuda grass and the warm season grasses, the hotter it gets, the better it grows. 
As soon as it gets cold, it go cool, it goes dormant. The ryegrass kicks in, but that's a double-edged sword because now any holes or, or weak spots <clears throat> that show in the Bermuda grass are now filled with ryegrass. And you count on hot weather the following spring to kill off the ryegrass. And if it's a cool spring, the ryegrass doesn't want to leave. Now the Bermuda is ready to go and it can't fill in the spots. So it really depends on what the municipality is after. Do they want green 12 months a year or are they willing to play in the winter on that thatch layer and then and do the best that they can with that? So that just to give folks a, a, a taste of the kind of analysis that goes on that is to some degree unique, you know, given expectations, right? Given the conditions, given the weather, and there is variability, right? You could have a tough winter, you could have a warm winter, you could have a very cold winter. And so all of these things, that's why having people like you've been in place are critical to adjusting, adjusting schedules and working with the, the scenario that you're presented with. The other issue um, that came up is, what do you do with grass clippings, Ben? And, and what's your recommendation on that? Yep, uh, mulch them in. Don't ever bag them, but at least out here in Colorado. I know there's times where you have uh, diseases or other issues that you wanna get rid of that, but those clippings add extra nitrogen that's all free nitrogen back to the soil. Same with leaves, you know, it's, it's a big talking point in the fall every year. Everyone you know, likes to bag their leaves just mulch them in. It adds extra nutrients and organic matter, and uh, it really helps out that soil. Yeah. The other issue, again, a management question, uh, and this comes up, of course, everywhere, is invasives, and how uh, has that been a problem for you, and how have you dealt with that? Yes. So like Chip had mentioned, you know, we picked purposely two parks that didn't have a lot of issues. I wasn't going to try to tackle the one that's got the worst soil and you know make it not work. So these two parks I haven't had a lot of issues with weeds. Uh, I think I'll steal Chip's uh, saying of our herbicide is overseeding. Mm -hmm. When we have a whole bunch of weed pressure, we just keep aerating, keep overseeding, double the rate, triple the rate even if you know, some areas to just really get germination and push them out. But we, have, we have had, you know, a kind of thistle in some areas, and that's a real problem in our turf areas, and it, it is hard to manage. And that's the one piece we haven't really tackled yet. And so but we do have those issues, yeah. Yeah. But Chip, your experience, thank you for that, your experience um, with this whole question of competing out unwanted vegetation, is that, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I would go so far as to say that the judicious use of nitrogen from fertilizer can be an herbicide. And, and I've shown that in some of my own little you know, non-university trials that if you have the grass that you can't overseed and around the country, we work with lots of grasses that you can and lots of grasses that you can't. Grass seed will outcompete weed through density, but if we don't have that flexibility, now we have to think outside the box. So nine out of 10 people are not going to think about nitrogen from fertilizer as an herbicide. But we know that if we stimulate the reproductive structures of the grass, whether it's tillers, underground stems, rhizomes, above ground stolons, we are going to begin to push back and occupy spaces and crowd weeds before they get to be a problem. So in some of the projects we've done in the warm season regions of the country, that's one of the things that we had in our back pocket was to head off certain weed pressures at certain times of the year, we played with nitrogen a little bit. Now, again, that's a budget issue, 
Um, but so isn't grass seed, you know. So instead of reaching for grass seed, we're going to put a little bit of extra nitrogen in there. Typically, we run modest nitrogen programs because we're building it up from the soil and using soil borne nitrogen through the microbial complex. But when we're trying to push weeds until we get that soil really firing from the microbial perspective, extra fertilizer can help push back and occupy spaces. And what type of fertilizer weed. are you talking about when you say nitrogen and fertilizer? We're talking about an organic fertilizer, a water insoluble organic fertilizer, if it's a granular. Uh, if we have the luxury of working with a liquid program, we now have some of the new amino acid nitrogen, 100% organic, that's water soluble, and it acts just like synthetic fertilizer. It gets in very quickly. So, but everything that we're talking about would be would be organic compatible. So a lot, and this happened to us in Portland actually. Uh, uh, an ordinance passes; it's focused on organic compatible product but doesn't touch fertilizers. Some, some councils will say, let's just start with pesticides. Putting fertilizers in the ordinance is too heavy a lift. Um, and then you go out and you, you, you stand on the football field with the uh, you know park supervisor. And they say, I've got this urea here in the shed that I'm gonna be using with this organic program that you're gonna put together for me, Chip. How do you respond to that and, and the need? How does the fertilizer fit into the overall program? And why is separating the two not a good idea? Yeah, and that was um, that actually wasn't Portland. It was a neighboring community of, of South Portland. And he, Sorry, was, he was convinced that synthetic was the only way to go and would not. I mean, he was cutting his grass at one inch in the cool season region of the country and pumping it up with synthetic fertilizer because he believed that he saw Fenway Park in Boston and that's what they did. And that's what you had to do. Um, the reality is he was working against himself. And I was on that field this summer. And it's exactly like we said it was going to be five years ago, that you're going to get yourself in a hole. And he's in a huge hole. And it's because synthetic fertilizer is salt. NPK is just simply mineral salt. And think about living organisms and salt. Salt's not conducive to healthy biological population. So continuing to fertilize with water soluble salts is like just putting a little blowtorch right down there into the microbial community and burning it up. And so when you make that commitment to manage organically, you have to make that commitment, just like Ben did from day one, to feed the soil with organic materials and let the soil feed the plant. Right. And that's where, you know, if if you if you show up on a field and you say, I need soil samples, uh, Ben had and Chip shows up and says, Oh, I see your soil chemistry, I see your soil structure test. And then he comes and he says, I need a soil food web test. Is that something you learned in school? Not at all. I I said, what do you need? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we have to, to mail these bags of soil all the way to New York. And it was kind of a funny thing. But yeah, it, it, it really is part of that program of knowing what you have you know, organism-wise in the soil and trying to help them grow and live and, and you know, multiply and stuff like that. It was, it was entertaining to learn that. Right. So just to clarify, um, Chip asks for a soil food web analysis, which looks like the level of microbial activity in the soil. And this is where this interplay between fertility and soil microbial life is so important. Can you, can you talk about that whole breakdown process just briefly, Chip? It, sure. So when we when we take soil and put it under a microscope, we're now going beyond the typical soil chemistry test, right? We're going to take soil chemistry, which is important, NPK, cal, mag, sulfur, and all of the organic matter and all that, but it has to be married up with the biological fraction, and that's what determines soil health. So it goes under a microscope, and we identify bacteria, fungi, protozoa, higher level predators. How much is in there in total? 
but most importantly, what is actively working at that snapshot in time that we pulled the soil out of the ground. And that guides our strategy. So when we when Ben recycles a grass clipping or when we he puts down an organic fertilizer, it is single cell bacteria that break that down and that nitrogen gets in their bodies. The higher level protozoa comes along and eats that bacteria, literally consumes it. Protozoa is a low nitrogen organism and it simply sloughs off or expels the nitrogen as ammonium nitrogen, rate available to the plant. And some is held in the soil on the exchange sites. Nitrifying bacteria converts some of that to nitrate. Now the grass gets what it needs through this biological interaction. Synthetic fertilizers interrupt that. So sticking with organic fertilizers makes that happen. As I mentioned in my talk, 50% of what I do focuses on the grass, but the other 50% is strictly geared to making that bacteria, fungi, and protozoa more active. Most of the soils that Jay and I start with can generate between 25 and 100 pounds of nitrogen on their own with natural processes. Our goal is 150 to 200 pounds. And once we get there, think of how much less we have to buy from a bag. Yeah. But in a nutshell, that's how it works. So we're basically at time. Uh, this could go on all evening, but we are at time, unfortunately. I just want to raise a, a final question here, which comes up more and more as we visit around the country, and that is the pressure that we're seeing in communities to transition to synthetic turf mm -hmm. um, and how that is influencing how the sales company or sales people um, of the producers of these products are um, having great influence. Um, and in many ways, one of the arguments, um, there are a lot of arguments, but one is, of course, maintenance. Uh, another is water use. Another is, you know, issues around um, concern, public issues around spraying pesticides. Um, and, you know, we find again, like like Chip mentions uh, and Avery, you've mentioned on misinformation and myths, we're seeing a lot of misinformation around water use, chemical use, antibiotic, uh, antimicrobial use, not mentioned often, water to bring down the heat uh, on, on these fields. Um, and then, you know, the the larger questions about this interaction with the environment and covering over, um, you know, soil and uh, areas that are interacting with nature and supporting uh, life underground. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to say about that. I don't know if you've experienced this in Portland um Avery but this is happening we're seeing this across the country we haven't um had an actual like campaign around that we we do have a couple of these fields in Portland um and it's sort of starting to come up because of a of issue with a soccer team that's coming to town um but it certainly is an issue and and you know the talking points that we've already you know kind of focused in on with this is PFAS. Maine is way ahead of the curve on PFAS pollution. Right. So you mentioned PFAS around here and people are like, oh, geez. So artificial turf is filled with PFAS. These are the forever, um, you know, plastics that that don't ever break down. And, and, you know, we have them in all our bodies and they're linked to all kinds of concerning health problems. Um, uh, these yeah. fields also become heat islands. So there's a heat issue, particularly if you're in a city, a suburb, we're all dealing with climate change, it's getting hotter. So these are making it worse. There can be odors um, off gas from them. And then you also, you know, if you're a town that cares about water pollution, well, it's gonna rain on this thing at some point and it's gonna slough off something, even those, you know, uh, PFAS, they do rinse around and end up in the ocean. So, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of um, negatives uh, that can be talked about, but we haven't, you know, right. really campaigned on that specifically. And often what we're finding is w there's not a comparison with organic land management or turf management versus synthetic. It's usually the conventional versus synthetic. And so, again, this is something that we at Beyond Pesticides are 
have been working on and you know with all the issues around um accidents that we've been reading about uh, with the nfl and so forth national football league um and the fact that uh, the world cup does not allow play on synthetic fields the, these are for health reasons as well so um something we want we want to work with communities on as well but in the context of advancing organic as a solution to so many of these problems a lot of great questions out there today um issues about compost issues about what's allowed in organic and what's not allowed in organic um these are all incredibly important questions um uh, we can probably just fill a follow-up session on this so uh if please take my phone call if you hear from me in the future here if we want to have a follow-up session on this um but we really appreciate all your time today and appreciate the great level of participation that we've gotten through the q a um thank you thank you thank you for all you're doing you guys are leaders uh, in this field and are helping to really create a sustainable future. So can't thank you enough for being part of this session today. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for all the participants uh, as well. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.